We are in the book of Job. We are in session six. We're going to do this. In, we're going to try to do Job in eight sessions, which in some respects can be a little superficial. Some places at the same time, we think this is a value in, in, in moving right along. So, so um, okay, we're in in session six. We're in chapters thirty eight. Uh, well, theoretically to the end of the book, but we'll probably take a couple of chapters tonight, about two chapters. And so we've, we've uh, managed our way through the uh, comforters, <laughs> these advisors, what I call the ash heap trio. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we also uh, spent uh, the previous six chapters on Elihu, this interesting spirit-filled young man that sort of sets the stage for the climax of the book, which we're now into. The chapters 38 and following is, of course, the climax of the book. And God himself now steps in to these discussions. We can count probably about 77 questions that um, God, instead of answering Job's questions, God raises questions, confronts Job with questions, about 77 of them. You know, it's interesting that the uh, pursuit of scientific research is the legitimate pursuit of man. It was ordained, in effect, in the Garden of Eden, in chapter 1, verse 28, where, man was told, where God told man to take dominion of the earth and subdue it. And so this is the mandate that undergirds every legitimate enterprise, not the least of which is scientific research. And the tragedy, of course, is that man has insisted on institutionalizing his own um, uh, rationalizations, independent of acknowledging the majesty of God as evident in the creation. It's going to be interesting how God will focus these questions on the creation. And that's a, a major signal to us, that the creation is important. You know, some people figure, well, some people are into this creation-evolution debate, and that's great. Some people are not. Actually, that undergirds the whole uh, issue of who God is and what he's done. He, he takes that very, very seriously, his handiwork. See, science claims to be the pursuit of truth, but that's, a, that's just propaganda. Science is the pursuit of mechanistic rationalizations independent of God. And uh, that's a, uh, that's that's tragic. You know, the, the great founding fathers of science, uh, Newton, Boyle, Pascal, and all of those, they pursued their pursuit of science because they were they saw it as a path to demonstrate the glory of God. They were God fearing men, and uh, but of course, most fields of study have been taken over by humanists, and Christians, by their indifference, have yielded to this satanic takeover of science. Mm -hmm. So science, which should have been the, the, uh, the great testimony to the majesty of God, has really become a device for ignoring and rejecting and preying upon the uninformed. And that's the tragedy today. But we're going to see, in, 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 as God now steps into this complex philosophical dialogue that's been going on now for you know 37 chapters, it's interesting, God, how he deals with this. What's his message? What's God's response to Job's uh, request for a hearing, for a trial? Well, God's, <laughs> he's going to step in. Job chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said. Now, by the way, this is the first time that we encounter in this book, since the prologue, the name of Jehovah or Yahweh or however you want to say the unpronounceable name of God. His special name is used here. Now, Job's the sufferer, his plea, which has been repetitious for, for a hearing, is now being answered by God himself. But of course, instead of answering the questions, God's going to ask, ask some questions. Now, it's interesting, this world winter storm is exactly what Elihu had predicted back there in chapter 37. We often see a storm, uh, clouds and thunders and lightning and so forth, um, when God appears. He did so at Sinai in Exodus 19 and a lot of other places. Clouds are always associated with it because they're protecting the audience from being destroyed by his majesty. So on the one hand, they declare his presence. On the other hand, they, they act as a protective mask so that we don't get destroyed by his holiness. This idea of a whirlwind, by the way, should, as we think of the Bible, it occurs all the time. Remember Jesus, when he talked to Nicodemus, he said God is a spirit. And he's like the wind where you can tell where he's been, but you can't see it kind of thing. 
in, in, John, in John chapter 3. Also the wind, uh, like a rushing wind at Pentecost, chapter 2. Just to name a couple. You can go all through the scripture and you'll discover that very often the Holy Spirit moves in, 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 in the form of a wind. And uh, so anyway, God's opening remarks, verse 2. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> that describes a lot of people we've probably heard. But he's, uh, he's lumping up the whole gang here. Now some commentators, you'll find, assume from verse 2 that God is hereby rebuking Elihu. And they misunderstand the whole text, in my opinion. Some commentators demean Elihu. We've taken a different view altogether. We, we side with those commentators that see Elihu as a very, very key bridge from these three guys that are the losers, if you will, and uh, God himself stepping in. And I hold to that view because I think these words don't apply to Elihu. They apply to Job. Job himself, at the end of the book, will apply those words to himself. God is addressing this discourse not to Elihu, to Job. And he says, Gird up now, thou loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and thou answer thou. I mean, that's, God is challenging Job here um, by his own ignorant words that he's been darkening the light that should have come to him. And it, we do that a lot too, by the way. See, Job's error here is that he's talking when he should have been listening. And we all do that. You know, it's as if we're a half duplex. If you're in general, you know what I mean? Where you, that's like a channel that you have to turn around. One person can talk and then you turn over to the other. See, life is like that. You know, you, you, you generally don't have your receiver on if you're transmitting. <laughs> you see, and that's, that's sort of what's going on here. But also, um, God says, gird up thy loins. That's a, we don't use that in our vocabulary. But see, in those days, when somebody was about to undertake something very strenuous, like running, fighting, or, or just working hard, he would take his flowing robes and stuff them in a sash girding up his loins. In other words, that, that phrase implies get ready for something strenuous, for to be confronted. It's like getting ready for a fight or, a, or a, be, be alert is what he's saying. And a struggle is coming. And well, you know, Job has been screaming for a trial before God from several, all through his, these discourses. Well, now uh, he, God shows up, but God asks him the questions. And the next few questions, you could sort of subtitle, where were you? And uh, verse 4, where, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. You know, it's interesting how many people make their careers as cosmologists talking about how the question of origins, and they haven't been there, obviously. In fact, science is the art of observation and experimentation and repetition. Repeating an experiment is essential, which means that the study of origins is not a science. It's perfectly reasonable to take what we think we know and make conjectures. The trouble is those conjectures get passed on as if they were truth. They're just conjectures. So God's going to ask Job a series of questions in about three different areas. The first area will be his creation. It's interesting how God um, puts his creation right up front as an expression of his majesty and the fact that he is God. And that's the main message in Job. We'll try to tie it all together when we get to the, uh, uh, you know, the end of the, of the study here and put it all in perspective. But one of the things we'll discover, if the book of Job is, is, is why do the innocent suffer, God never answers it. God never deals with his suffering in here. God's going to talk on for four chapters. Uh, he answers a lot. That isn't the real issue. It seems to be the issue. No, it's just the real issue is the existence of God and who he is and who is man in respect to him. And that's what's really going to emerge here. So God will talk about his creation. The second area is his providential care. He'll talk about the balance of nature. Who feeds the animals? As we, the ecologists like to always pronounce cosmic doom if we have a half a percent more ozone or something. Hey, turn that coin over. If the ozone layer is that sensitive, who balanced it in the first place? See, every one of those delicate issues is an argument for design. It's an argument against randomness. And it turns out there's dozens, well, we'll get to that a little bit later, dozens of ratios. If we take everything we think we know about our physical universe and try to model it, make a mathematical model of what we think we know, we discover some very strange things. We discover that almost every ratio is in delicate balance. Some of these ratios, if you change one part in 10,000, life is impossible. Everything is in incredibly delicately balanced. And this is so obvious that scientists have even given this aspect a name. They call it the anthropic principle. Because one of the early scientists pointed out it's, it's as if the universe was designed for man. To which we say, 
No kidding, Dick Tracy. <laughs> but see, the evidence of design is everywhere. and God hold, It's so evident that God holds everyone accountable for it. That's what Romans chapter 1 is all about. God, the creation itself can hold us accountable. And uh, that's what Paul, he's going to be doing here. Anyway, God talk about his creation, his providential care. And then he's going to talk about his restraint of the evil forces in, in, in the world. In fact, he'll even put Job in that spot. He says, you want to play God? What would you, how would you control the proud and so forth? And so he puts really Job on the spot through here. But it's really good. Anyway, the, one of the first things that really hits you between the eyes as you start studying Job is how prominent the, uh, and fundamental is the creation in Christian apologetics. It's the foundation. And uh, it's really essential that we not be confused on that. It's tragic that most churches, many Christians, try to say, well, evolution was God's way of creation. No, that's, that's not what the scripture says. And God deals with that here. He deals with it in one chapter in Genesis and four chapters here in Job. He hammers that God did everything specifically the way he wanted it. He designed the duck-billed platypus to prove that he had a sense of humor. <laughs> and, and, and these things produce after their own kind. And so uh, that, that's clearly what God instructs, what he shows us. And to try to deny that, to try to uh, accept these other conjectures and fanciful theories uh, is, is, is actually humorous, by the way. I love to, you know, people that love to talk about uh, kangaroos. You know, they have a pouch. That's called a marsupial if you have a pouch. Seahorses have, are marsupials. They have a pouch, but the pouch is on the male. Now, have an evolution explain how that happened. Okay. But anyway, uh, we'll move on. 35 times in Genesis... And all through these four chapters in Job, God is emphasized that he created every specific thing himself the way he wanted it, and they produce after their own kind. They are, we know today, digitally defined. Digitally, what do I mean by digitally defined? If you have a clock with hands, that's an analog display. The hand moves twice as far, it's twice as long. In other words, it's an analog of time going by. If you have a digital watch, which says that it's, you know, uh, 745 right now, that's alphanumeric. Those are digits. Those are symbols. You follow me? So a digital, a digital display operates in discrete steps. So uh, digital things don't evolve. They're designed. You have no, nowhere to have your digital... Uh, I ran into a guy who had a neat little thing. I'm going to have to make one of these for myself. He had a little string of beads. And he had on the beads, in different colors, he had uh, in Morse code... Genesis 1 1, in the beginning God created on the earth in Morse code. And he had like, interesting. But what's the chances of that happening by accident? It can't evolve. It couldn't happen in nature. Someone had to in, you know, insert that code, if you will, in that form to give it that representation. Digital thing. See, and what we've discovered with the DNA, the species are digitally designed. That's why there's not interspecies. You know, they're, they're, within a species, they're that nation, sure, but species are species. You know, ostriches don't become elephants. You know, they're, they're digitally defined. Anyway, we'll get into the ostriches and elephants here in a minute. Uh, okay, so God's first question is, hey, guy, were you there? <laughs> See, the essence of science is observation. No one was there to observe. Observation. Science involves observations, measurement, experimentation, and repeating the experiment. If you can't repeat the experiment, it's not science. It's a happenstance. So we're really left in the field of cosmology with conjectures. Some of them are very intelligent conjectures, given what they think they know. Fine, but they're conjectures. And we don't treat them as conjectures. And uh, one of the basic presumptions in science is unif uniformitarianism, that processes are in place that were always there and always will be. It's, there's uniformity in processes. And yet, when we look through, take a look through a pair of binoculars and look at the moon. You see a lot of pockmarks? It's been beat up. In fact, as we send space shuttles around to other planets and stuff, we find that it's characteristic of our solar system to have these planets pockmarked. They've been clobbered. The solar system has been in a rough neighborhood. Uniformitarian is there. There's been catastrophes, interruptions, nonlinearities. That's never in the theories, you see. And so uh, uh, buffeting nonlinearities, that, that, that puts these uniformitarian presumptions in great doubt, frankly. Every naturalistic or humanistic process contradicts the basic laws of science anyway. The laws of causality, the laws of conservation, and the laws of entropy. Well established, well understood, and yet these theories of origins fly in the face of all of those laws, by the way. 
But uh, so there's very little humility among cosmologists. I love the way that John Leffler summarizes cosmo the, the Big Bang. First there was nothing, and then it exploded. Okay, there you have it. Okay. You know, the ancient uh, tribes wor worshipped all these strange kinds of gods, gods of wood, stone, whatever, right? We've created the most insulting god of all. All those false gods, of course, insult the living god. But we've invented a god that's more insulting than any of those. See, the ancients ascribed the creation to, the, to these various pantheistic gods of various kinds. We've found an even more insulting way to deal with it, to say that no god was necessary. Our God is nothingness, emptiness. It all just happened by itself. Really? Yeah. Anyway, no one's ever solved the problem of origins because they can't solve the problem of the origin of information. You can't explain the origin of life because they can't explain the origin of information. And uh, so if you want to know how the world began, there's only one way you can. That's to ask the designer who did it. And that's what we're getting into. Okay, verse 5. God can do it. Who hath laid, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest and who hath stretched the line upon it? That's kind of an interesting model, even rhetorically. That implies that he had help. So the Trinity is even hinted here, but we'll move on. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, and who laid the cornerstone thereof? It's interesting that even today, the frontiers of science are dealing with the fabric of space. The fact that empty space has zero point energies that are enormous, and, and, and we're just, we, we, the nature of matter as a, as a bending of space time. These are concepts that are way out there, obviously, and uh, 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 the, the nature of space-time itself, that space and time are a continuum, and these are, these are uh, uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out how God hung the earth upon nothing, the way he says in Isaiah and here in Job. Anyway, verse 7, he said, anyway, who laid the cornerstone there, verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. And most, uh, most commentators in the, in the Hebrew think the morning stars, the sons of God, are both uh, parallelisms for angels. Uh, for, yeah, for angels. And the sons of God, it's a very key term. It's used in the, in the Old Testament consistently of direct creations of God called angels. These are not the lines of Seth that some people try to contrive. The Bene Elohim is a, is, is a, are angels. They're used in, a, in three places in Job and lots of other places, even in the New Testament, in effect. In John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, he came unto his own, his own received not, but as to many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, meaning direct creations of God, a new creation. He uses the same equivalent phrase in Luke 20, verse 36. So, but anyway, now God shifts from the creation at, in, in broad terms to one of its largest components, the sea, the oceans. And one of the most prominent features, about three-fourths of the planet Earth's surface is, are the seas. So verse 8 says, Or oh, who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of a womb? What on earth is he talking about? Anyone know? Flood of Noah. The water that covered the earth did not all come from the rain. But the fountains of the deep were opened up. That water came out and later it gets put away. So he even said, who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of a womb. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and the thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. It's interesting how the oceans now are stable. The isostatic boundaries are such that a deluge like that can never happen again. But it's interesting, God describes this all here. And who controls the tides within bounds? They're within very definitive mathematical bounds. See, the greatest geophysical uh, upheaval ever was the flood of Noah. And there's evidence of it all over the earth. Geological strata, fossil beds, all over the world are irrefutable witnesses of the, of the universal flood at one time. Uh, it's interesting, there's some, some Christian apologists say that uh, the flood of Noah was only a local flood. It wasn't a universal flood. If they say, make that statement, then they're calling God a liar. Because God promised Noah that he'd never do that again. And if that was a regional flood, there's been lots of regional floods since. And what God is saying, I'll never do that again. What, a universal flood? I mean, obviously God not only set the flood, but it's by his providential care that the uh, eight people were saved on the, on the ark and, and 
that the earth had was replenished. How? By God's intervention. It's interesting how you find a description of all this, not just in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, not just here in Job, but also in Psalm 104. You might put that in your notes. In Psalm 104, thou covers it with the deep as with a garment. The flood stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. In the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys into the place where thou hast found it for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over. They may not turn again to cover the earth. It goes on. Psalm 104. You might put that in your notes for this. It's a good comment on this. And uh, Okay, but now God shifts to day and night. The whole sidereal situation here. He's going to, beginning with this verse and continuing with four chapters, God is now going to deal with the present processes that we all experience and, and, and that do constitute a, 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 it's a valid mandate. Uh, f- uh, it's a proper domain of science and uh, uh, in, in concert with his commission to man to subdue the earth. And we're going to talk about the rotation of the earth in verses 12 through 15, the springs and pathways of the sea in verse 16, the breadth of the earth, how big is it in verse 18. That's one of the only questions we today can answer. Most of these questions that Job couldn't answer, we can't answer today. That's one that he couldn't answer and we can today thanks to satellite measurements and so forth. We do know how big the earth is. The travel of light in verse 19, the dividing of light in verse 24, and the source of rain and ice and all that in verse 20 to 30, and the universal nature of the physical laws, which itself is an interesting insight, and electrical transmission of communications in verse 35. These discoveries, many of these discoveries were made by God-fearing creationists of the past, um, guys like Newton, uh, Mari, I'll talk about Mari in a minute, Faraday, and Morse, and so forth. Verse 12, hast thou, God, hast thou commanded the morning since thy days or caused the day spring to know his place? The day, do you realize the sun gets up every morning in a different place? The sun rises at a different point in the horizon every day by the seasons. Who set that? Well, the procession of the earth. Yeah, but who organized all that? If it wasn't for the procession of the earth, if the earth turned a little faster, a little slower, life would be impossible. If the earth was a little bit close to the sun, it would be too hot. A little further away, too cold. It's at that place that the balance is perfect to support life. You can go through over a hundred ratios, which if they were changed a little bit, life's impossible. If the gravity on the earth was a little stronger, if the gravity on the earth was a little less, life's impossible. Almost every parameter that you start to model, you discover if you change it and follow through with the signals that changes, life doesn't work. It's an incredibly complex, intricate balance. And uh, that's what, in effect, God is dealing with here. Verse 13, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment, and from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Hast thou walked in search of its depth? <laughs> Back up a little bit here. The earlier things you talk about, uh, the light and darkness also is where it also gets associated with wickedness and so forth because the wicked operate where the light isn't shining. But uh, this issue of uh, when he starts talking about this, uh, the uh, secrets of the deep is very interesting because the secrets of the deep are still largely hidden. Oceanography is really in its beginnings. But it's interesting, the father of oceanography is an interesting story. Uh, Matthew Fontaine Murray was a young man and read in the Psalms and in Isaiah and in Job that there were pathways in the sea. There's pathways in the sea? That's a weird idea. So he joined the Navy, made that his calling, and he, he started, he got in a position where he got into the hydrographic offices and had them start collecting temperatures, all the ships at sea all the time, keeping logs, bring that in and start to analyze it. And he was the one that began to map that there are, you know, currents or pathways in the sea. And he did his whole career, the whole field of oceanography is built on his a commitment from reading the scripture. He talks about it in his autobiography and so forth. And uh, anyway, verse 17, God, God continues, have the gates of death been opened unto thee? What do we know about death? Not much. Got a lot of weird people writing stuff about it. Death's a, death is a mystery. It's a boundary. Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hardly. Death is still a mystery. Yes, I know there are books written about near-death experiences and all that, and take those with a great assault. Uh, be careful. But um, see, science really hasn't made a dent here. 
because there's very few people that came back from the death. And those that have, they don't listen to. <laughs> they got the, Jesus came back from the grave. He has the floor. So listen to what he has to say about it, you know. Go on. But anyway, verse 18, God continues, Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Hey, Job, you know how big the earth is? Oh, no. Now, we can be kind of smug. We have satellites, and we know that the, you know, it's, uh, you know, a sphere with 4,000 miles in radius, and more or less, except it's a blade spheroid, and we can measure it. And okay, great, because we have satellites. So that's one question, probably, of the, all, of the 77, there's one that we could probably muster a, a, a viable answer to. The rest we can't really, even today. Hast thou perceived the breath of the earth? Declare, if thou knowest it at all. It all. Verse 19. And where is the way where light dwelleth? Whew. And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof, and so forth. What is light? You know, it's one of the biggest mysteries in science. Uh, 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 it was J.J. Uh, J. Thompson that got the Nobel Prize for uh, discovery that light is a wave. And, uh, and I think it was 1937 later, his son got the Nobel Prize for proving that light was a particle. So light can behave as a wave, and light can behave as a particle, and light never operates the boat the same way, depending on how you're looking at it. And so it turns out that that's, we're suddenly in the area of, of particle physics, and does it get weird? We don't know a lot about what light really is. We know that all photons are immediately interconnected. Every photon knows what every other photon in the world is doing at that instant, no matter how far apart they are. That's bizarre. They call it, the scientists call it non-locality. And uh, it was a theory up until 1982 where they proved it in the laboratory. Strange stuff. I won't get into particle physics here except to point out that it, we are on the boundaries of reality itself. Reality has a boundary. They have, it has a boundary on the macrocosm, the large sense, because we discovered the great discovery of the 20th century science is the universe is finite. It's not infinite, it's finite. That's what the Big Bang gives testimony to and so forth. On the other end of the scale, this microscopic scale, there's a point at which you can no longer divide things in half. You can cut anything in half and get in half. And you get to the point of 10 to minus 33 centimeters and you can't break it anymore. It ceases to exist after that. It's digital is the point. Wow. Was, and they know it is from the way the mathematics works. It's digital mathematics. So it's, uh, I mean, discrete mathematics. So it's a uh, uh, strange stuff. So uh, God challenges Job. Do you know what even light? Do you know what to say anything about it? No. Darkness is the absence of light. We think, no. What about black holes? See, there, there is, God divide the, divided the light from the darkness. We naively think, well, gee, darkness is the absence of light. Well, it is and it isn't. Because you've got things called black holes that are so dense gravitationally that light can't leave them. It sucks things into them. And the whole phenomenon of mathematics of black holes is a big subject in, 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 uh, in uh, the frontiers of science and mathematics. Anyway, verse 21. Knowest thou it because thou wast, uh, because thou wast then born? <laughs> because the number of thy days is great? <laughs> Hardly. In other words, Job, where were you? you know, who are you, in effect, to theorize against God? Say, who are these scientists, by the way, studying these things in the absence of respect for the guy that did it in the first place? Verse 22, God continues, Hast thou entered, and I love this one, Hast thou entered into the treasures of snow? What on earth is that about? It has to do with warfare. Is there still some yet undiscovered physics of crystallography we have not uncorked yet? Verse 22 and 23, God says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? What? I thought he's talking about snowflakes and raindrops. And God's saying that they harbor some kind of treasure, some kind of secret that's relevant, that's been reserved against the time of trouble against the day of battle and war. Wow, what's going on here? Now we do notice that in eschatological battles, battles that have to do, thing, events that have to do with the end times, uh, we find hailstones being used. Joshua, God used jo hailstones to wipe out Joshua's enemies. The battle of Beth Horon where the sun stood still, it was those hailstones wiped out only Joshua's enemies. 
You want to talk about marksmanship. <laughs> God put those meteors in orbit thousands of years earlier specifically so that when they entered the earth, they would clobber just the bad guys. Read Joshua chapter 10. It's, in, it's, a, it's a fascinating fascinating thing. And uh, uh, Exodus chapter 9, Isaiah 30, Ezekiel 13, several places. Ha uh, Ezekiel 38, the Battle of Gog and Magog. And Haggai 2. And of course, Revelation 16. We have hailstones that weigh 100 pounds apiece. Think about that. That'll wreck your car. Yeah. <laughs> and yet... Also in verse 20, maybe there's a hint of still something else still to be discovered in the snow and the crystals and so on. <clears throat> verse 24, by what way is the light parted which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? The whole idea that light shines on the earth affects the, affects the weather. And indeed it does. When we have sunspots, magnetic storms in the sun, we have Different radio broadcast uh, emissions here on the air, you know, the aurora borealis, and you know, on it goes. Uh, there, there's a connection here. All meteorological phenomena are derived from light of the sun, the evaporation of the water, the clouds, and all that photosynthesis. It's interesting that even today, our most elaborate computer applications are applications of meteorology and their failures. They still can't predict the weather. They can't predict the weather a week from now or two weeks from now or whatever, and yet they, with great pontification, they worry about global warming from those defective computer models. 18,000 scientists say, no, there is no such thing as global warming, but the liberals still, still keep hammering that as an excuse to pursue their agenda. Anyway, God continues, who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters or the way for the lightning of thunder? To really get into this, we get into the most advanced fields of mathematics. We'd be talking about fractals. We'd be talking about, there's a field of mathematics, brand new, relatively new, called the theory of chaos. You know, a butterfly on one side of the earth can cause a hurricane on the other side of the earth. The, the apparently random processes are not random. There's, the thing is, such delicate balances, the smallest little change here affects everything else. That's sort of the flavor of what they call mathematically the theory of chaos. It, what it's really saying is that it ran, there's two, math, two things in mathematics that we cannot find in the physical universe. One is infinity. We understand it mathematically. We can't find it. Things are not infinitely large and infinitely small. They have limits. And also the randomness. We discover there really isn't such a thing as a random event. And we know that from the scripture, Proverbs 16.33, that the lot is in the lap of the Lord. Okay? So when you didn't win the lottery, that was the Lord's fault. Okay? All right. <laughs> He didn't want you to win yet. All right. Verse 26, to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man. Yeah, it rains in the desert even though there's no one there. Man's not helping. God's doing that. Right? Reminds me of this whole business when a tree falls in a forest. Is there sound? You know, that's a big debate. I mean, there's, no sound, there's no sound if no one is there to hear it. Lots of physio. That's a, you know, there's a variation of that in our culture. That if, if, if a man says something in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, is he still wrong? You know? okay. Why are flowers beautiful? We, we discover, we go down the deepest part of the seats where it's dark, there's no light. When they get light down there, it's beautiful. There's all kinds of colors, all kinds of exotic things. Why? No one's there to see it. They can't see it. There's no light to see it if they could. Well, why are flowers beautiful? Well, to attract the bees for pollination. That sounds good in grade school until you find out that bees are colorblind. So why are they pretty? Because it pleased God. It was made for his pleasure. That's, it's not functional. It ha may happen to be functional too. That's not why they're beautiful. Certainly that's why not you, that's why you, that, that doesn't explain the variety. Verse 28, ha hath the reign of father or who hath begotten the drops of dew? It speaks metaphorically here. Out of whose womb come the ice and the hoary frost of heaven? Who gendered it? The waters are hid as with the stone and the face of the deep is frozen. By the way, something you need to know. You know, if you study physics, you discover that almost everything expands when it gets hot and contracts when it's cold. If you have an iron bar and measure it at one temperature and you measure it at a higher temperature, it's slightly longer. It, things expand when they get hot. That's why they have cracks in the bridge, you know, in bridges. You know, so, and and you ha you, you, when you have construction, you leave gaps to allow for expansion or contraction, whatever. Right? 
everything in the universe. There's a couple of exceptions that go the other way. Um, but there's a weird exception. It's called water. Because water expands when it freezes. And it doesn't do it linear. It does it in a very peculiar curve. If it didn't, life would be impossible. Life, uh, ice is an exception to all the typical rules of, of uh, physical chemistry. Because ice, when it freezes, expands, therefore it floats, therefore rivers freeze from the top down, therefore you have fish that can live through the winter, and so on. It's an exception. It's like a footnote in, the, in, in God's laws. It's interesting. And uh, strange, strange exception. Verse 31. Canst thou, oh, this one, I love this one. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Now, most of us recognize Orion as that, it's that constellation up there. We often joke that he's the Irish hunter, Orion. Yeah. But it, anyway, he's, he's a, and that's just a label for a collection of stars. Constellations are simply labels we give to groups of stars. And we, they have characteristic rela patterns so we can we use them geographically. Such and such is just north of Orion or something. We can find our way around. Just They're convenient labels. The Pleiades, the seven sisters, as it's sometimes called, is a group of stars you can spot because there's a conspicuous little seven grouping. Unless you have good eyes or binoculars, you find there's more than seven there. But they're classically known as the seven sisters. Or more properly, the Pleiades. And Orion is another constellation that most of us know. But here's what's interesting, and a lot of people love these two because Jesus mentioned in the book of Job. Well, there's more to it than that. God says, can you bind the sweet influences of Orion and the Pleiades? You'll discover something, if you're an astronomer or an astrophysicist, and you study the stars, you'll quickly discover that those constellations are not really groups of stars, they just look like they are, because some of those stars are very close and some are very far away. They're not really grouped the way they look, because we're just seeing... It's like a crowd. We're seeing a group. They're not necessarily physically grouped. You with me? They're, 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 dis they're spread by distances that are enormous between the members of that group. So it just looks like a group from where we are. There are two exceptions to that in the heavens. Where the stars are gravitationally connected. The Pleiades and Orion. And I was stunned when an astronomer pointed that out to me. Because that's exactly what he's saying. Can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades or lose the bands of Orion? How on earth did Job know that? Or did the writer of this book know that? No, God did. And he's, made, he's, he's got the floor here. Then he goes on, verse 32. Canst thou bring forth... Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? The Maseroth, it's amazing how many commentators haven't done their homework. They don't know what the Maseroth means. They make, they make a few guesses. The Maseroth is the Hebrew term for what you and I would call the Zodiac. And what's that all about? The sun has an apparent path through the sky, through the air. And that apparent path is called the ecliptic. 15 degrees on either side of that, one hour on either side of that, so to speak, there's a band of convenience. Within that band, there are 12 groups of stars that have names. We know those names from the secular world. What's astonishing is the names are the same throughout all cultures on the planet Earth in the secular world. They go by different languages, but they're, they're essentially the same legends and same stories, pretty much. What's interesting is they all date back to the Tower of Babel. What's even more interesting is they had names before Babel. We are familiar with the corruption of those names throughout pagan history. We use pagan names because they're convenient. That's right. If you, if you want to tell us, if you're looking for uh, a star, it's in the constellation of such and such. You, uh, 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 someone's interested, you know, that's a stargate. Who knows exactly where to look by the hour angle, the declination, and so on. Well, what's interesting, you all have, may have attended planetarium shows in which they try to tell you, that, well, those, you know, here's, here's the Big Dipper. You know, that, that was what, that's called the bear, the Big Bear, 
Or bet, what's a better example is Cassiopeia. It looks like a bent W up there. Well, that's the lady chained in the chair. And they try to tell you that those, those, those names are legends that the ancients inferred by the arrangement of the stars, and nothing could be sillier because those, in no way does that bent W look like a lady sitting in a chair. You follow me? They just, ha they just have passed on traditions not knowing the origin. What you need to know in each of these clusters of stars is the names of the stars in the order of their brightness. And you need to know the names in Hebrew. If you can't find the Hebrew names, you can find the typically the Arabic names and make some guesses of how it fits together. And you discover something interesting. The, or, the names of the stars in the order of brightness suggest a story. The story can be embodied in a, in a picture that is associated with a group of stars, but it's not because of the arrangement, it's because of the names of the stars in the order of brightness. Now, you discover, when you look at the 12 constellations, you discover that they portray the plan of God from Virgo, the virgin birth, to Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you need to know the names. Why does Virgo, it's a virgin, and she's carrying an ear of corn in one hand, and, 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 and you remember what Christ said, and, and how is the virgin associated with an infant? It's a virgin birth. It gets complicated. A number of the great scholars, E.W. Bullinger, J.A. Seiss, and two or three others, have written books on this, if you're interested in this area. And, uh, but it, it's interesting, there is a widespread belief among the Persians and others that the, the Matzeroth was used to teach the children God's plan long before the Tower of Babel. What happened at Babel is that got corrupted with pagan relabeling. And that's what we're all victims of. Follow me? It also turns out those 12 constellations are identified with the 12 tribes of Israel. And the standards are associated with that. With, with the Judah, the lion of the, Judah, Judah's path was the lion, and uh, Reuben the man, Ephraim the ox, and Daniel, and so forth. And, and uh, so uh, there's, there's a, lot of going, a, lot, a lot of things going on here about the Matzeroth, which is the Hebrew term for the zodiac. Don't misunderstand. We're not talking astrology here. We're not talking that kind of thing. We're talking uh, just the ancient background of the names of those groupings. Anyway, let's move on. We're down to verse 33. God challenged him, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds that abundance of waters may come to thee? Okay, in other words, can you change the weather? Yeah. Canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Where? Here we are. Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Who hath given understanding to the heart? God's asking him questions, putting him on the spot. See, he even challenges us to research man's ability to do research. That's what he's saying. Where did the brain come from? Is a sort of the equivalent thing. Who designed the language and the machinery that makes up our DNA? These are the kinds of questions that are being thrown at Job here. Verse 37, who can number the clouds in wisdom or who can stay the bottles of heaven when the dust groweth into hardness and the clouds cleave fast together? In other words, who waters the desert when it needs it? And so forth. Now, the next three verses, I suggest, probably belong really to the next chapter because he changes subjects here and goes into about who feeds the animals? Who feeds the animals? <laughs> this is almost humorous the way God is, is poking Job here. He says, will you hunt prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and abide uh, in, in, in the covert to lie in wait? Who provideth for the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. See, God supplies their needs. God preserves the species. Man destroys them. See, man gets on the scene. They be, these species become extinct. Job 39 continues. Now he's going to talk about obstetrical care of the animals. He says, Knowest the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? Canst thou number the months that they fulfill? Knowest thou the time when they bring forth? They bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows. The young ones are in good liking. They grew up with corn, they go forth, and they return not unto them. By the way, one thing I'm sparing you, because we, we, I don't think it's that fruitful, the Hebrew in Job is very difficult. 
A number of great scholars have retranslated slightly, and there's some, di there's some discussion about some of the phrasing and so forth. It can mean slightly different things. So understand that some of the Hebrew, it's very early Hebrew. See, this is the oldest book in the Bible, Job is. And so there are some, some uh, 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 interesting difference of opinion about subtleties. I've, I've spared you all that because they're not consequential, in my opinion, about most things here. There's a few I'll show you here in a minute, but... but uh, uh, anyway, let's go on. So if certain phrasing seems a little awkward, part of it, it's poetry and it's written in another language. So it's, tr translation is difficult. Verse 5. See, God is going to express his delight in diversity. He says, Who hath sent out the wild ass free? Or who hath loosed the bands of the wild ass? Whose house I have made the wilderness, and whose barren land his dwellings, who scorneth the multitude of the city, neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searcheth after every green thing. He's alluding here to the personality of the, the donkey. He likes to be, the wild, the wild ass is always away from the city, out in the wilderness. That's where he's happy, away from people. Shows a lot of judgment, I think, maybe. <laughs> but God's saying, who gave him this diversity? Who gave him these instincts? God did, for his own pleasures, is the implied answer here. Verse 9. Then we have... Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by the curve? You know, they always say, don't play leapfrog with a unicorn, right? Okay. No? Okay. Sorry. All right. I had to work that in. The word unicorn is an unfortunate translation. It comes from the, the, the Septuagint and the Vulgate. But it, uh, it, uh, the, he, the word in the Hebrew is riem, and it is widely recognized by modern scholarship as a reference to the urox or the wild ox which inhabited the Middle East and other regions, but has been extinct since about 1625. So it's, a, it's not a unicorn in spite of the colorful implications that might have. It's the a, it's a, it's a, it's a Hebrew term for a, a wild ox. And he goes on, Canst thou bind him with his band in the furrow? Will he harrow the valleys after thee? Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather into thy barn? <laughs> This is, you know, obviously God is being facetious here. I love this. You get some insight here. See, the untamable nature of this creature is what's in reference here. And that was given to him by God. And man can neither explain it or change it. Some of you girls know husbands can be like that at times, right? Verse 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or the wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Now he gets into the ostrich. This is kind of fun stuff. God addresses the apparent stupidity of the ostrich, and God takes the blame for it. That's what's kind of amusing. He, he's going to make fun of the ostrich, but he also points out he made it, he's that way because I made him that way. It's got to be one of the most humorous passages in Scripture. Let's jump in, verse 14. Speaking of the ostrich, which leaves her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in the dust and forgetteth that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear, because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifted up herself on high, she scorneth the horse, who's right her. In other words, she can outrun the horse. They're clocked at over 40 miles an hour. Ostrich. And, uh, and yet she leaves her eggs out in the open. So not to take care of her young, but see, God seems to like it that way. For whatever, he did it for his pleasure. That's, that's, that's God's point here. See, there's many animals, there are many animals that among others, point to God's sense of humor. Have you ever visited Australia and looked at a duck-billed platypus? It looks like it's assembled from spare parts that were left over. <laughs> it is the weirdest creature you've ever seen. And the camel. <laughs> you know, they always joke, a camel was a horse designed by a committee. You know? <laughs> Those of you who've been in the defense industry say, no, no, an elephant is a camel designed to mill spec. You know? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> then he goes into a poem on the horse and this is anyone that loves horses loves this poem because he really captures the horse verse 19 hast thou given the horse strength hast thou clothed his neck with thunder canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper the glory of his nostrils is terrible he paweth in the valley he rejoiceth in his strength he goeth on to meet the armed men he mocketh at fear he is not affrighted neither turneth he back from the sword the quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with a fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He, he saith among the trumpets, ha ha, and he smelleth the battle afar off and the thunder of the captains and the shouting. This is the horse, fearless, competitive, 
He's been extolled in poetry uh, in the history of man, but rarely as elegant as God himself describes him here. The unique character of the horse, loving conflict, loving competition. Now he goes on to address what is typically called the hawk and the eagle. It's probably a different kind of vulture than the, the eagle as we think of it, but let that go on here. Doth the hawk fly by wisdom and stretch her wings towards the south? Does the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on a rock, upon the crag of a rock, and upon the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood, and the slain are there. There she. So, you know, there's a lot of emphasis here on the provision for animals. Um, if we were doing, uh, if we were do, using graphics in here, I would be tempted to, 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 to deviate here a little, talking about the, the golden plover. I was fascinated by this discovery. A little tiny bird, weighs about 120 grams, flies from Alaska to Hawaii every year. Now, if you do the arithmetic, he can't make it. He doesn't have the energy. He's got to do a quarter of a million fl wing flaps to get from Alaska to Hawaii. Uh, Dr. Werner Gitt uh, put this all together. I was looking at the charts and the mathematical answers. It was fascinating because it turns out the way they make it, this little bird picks up 80 grams. It goes from 120 grams to 200 grams for the energy. And you can figure out the, you know, the, the fuel consumption of the flight, and you discover it can't quite make it. It can't quite make it, but it does. How does it do it? It flies in formation. It saves 20% of the fuel by flying in formation, by rotating the lead to bird. Just like a you know, race driver drafts, if you're familiar with that, same idea. So it's interesting. Uh, if you go through all the arithmetic, by flying in formation, he has six grams to spare for headwinds. See, there's no islands, and they can't swim. I mean, this is interesting. It's a, it's a 4,000 mile thing. The real mystery to me is how does he know how to get there? <laughs> they have studied every conceivable thing you imagine: the magnetic fields of the Earth, the g g gravity, uh, stars. Uh, they, they, there's all kinds of theory. People have done their PhD, tried all kinds of theories, punctured every one of them. They have no idea, to my knowledge. And I, I hope I get surprised and find out. I'm really interested. How on earth they navigate? They've been studying like crazy because they think maybe they'll discover some other additional aids to navigation. How they don't, they don't know, and they're and they're born with this knowledge, built into them somehow. God put it there, and the, the flight of birds. All these different birds have different origins, go different places. How do they navigate? No one knows. Not by the, what's interesting about this one. See, there's no there's no visual cues. Not not across the not from Alaska to Hawaii across the ocean with no islands. How do they get there? Stars? Hey, there's overcast. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of, everything, everything you come up with has been punctured by, as they try to pursue this. So Matthew 10, 9, 29, Jesus says, uh, Are there not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father knowing? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, for ye are much more valuable than many sparrows. But how interesting, God watches over everything. Not a sparrow can fall to the ground without his knowing. All of these are for the pleasure of God. Well, we finally get to uh, Job 40. And we'll only take a few verses here, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, we're going to make it. My engineer's nervous because we're getting close to the trail here. Uh, Job chapter 40, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? In other words, are you going to instruct God? Where were you? You weren't even there. You, how, how can you instruct God? See, this is all derivative from, from Job's challenge of some of the things, you know, what God's doing here. You see? Shall he contendeth with the Almighty, uh, that contendeth with the Almighty, instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. See, well, Job, are you uh, able to argue with God? How have you done with this examination? How many questions did you answer? I won't ask you guys for a show of hands. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. See, Job's really in fact saying, Yes, I'm not in your league. I'm out of my depth. So Job is silenced, but God isn't finished. He's just getting warmed up here. Verse 6, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also annul my judgment? That's the root thing here. This is all preamble. Wilt thou condemn me, thou that mayest be righteous? 
See, God now brings this whole thing into moral judgment, into discussion. He, he invites Job now to mount the throne of God and, as it were, see what he would do if he was in God's shoes, so to speak. Verse 9, hast thou an arm like God? Canst thou thunder like a vo- uh, with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath and behold everyone that is proud and abase him. See, now God puts his finger on the problem that is really in Job's heart. Can he handle the proud? Verse 12, look on everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. If you know, if you can handle these things, then you might be able to handle your own problem and give yourself victory that you previously claimed. And this is all preamble because now he's getting really warmed up and we're going to go into that next time. We've left, he's talk, we've talked about 10 animals. There's two left. These two animals are really interesting animals. So next time, we're going to talk about dinosaurs and dragons. And the question you might be mulling over this, have you heard the legends of these fire-breathing dragons, the Chinese and other legends? Are they myth? Or are they relics from a true, uh, true relics from an ancient past? So, okay, we've got the behemoth and the leviathan. Behemoth is the land animal. Leviathan is the sea animal. Many commentators try to say, well, they're a crocodile. They have all these weird theories. They don't fit the text at all. Forget that nonsense. These creatures are real creatures at the time, living and breathing a God that God could talk to Job about because he knew what they were. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about them. But that doesn't finish the subject because why are these two animals, why do they have 44 verses dedicated to them more than all the other 12 animals put together. What's going on here? Why are these two creatures so prominent in the Word of God? Is there something else brewing here? Stay tuned. We'll keep that next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Next time we get together, you might want to bring your kids. Kids seem to love dinosaurs, but it should be fun. It should be a fun time. And that will leave the last session, the next session after that, to wrap up the whole book. And that also will, I think, have some surprises. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you. We thank you that you've given us such a treasure, your word. We thank you too, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you've revealed your word to us. We thank you, Father for Jesus Christ, for we do have a Redeemer that lives and ever makes intercession for us. We thank you, Father, that we are in such an incredible position thanks to your initiative and your caring and your provision. But Father, we do really understand that we cannot understand these things without you, without your Holy Spirit revealing it to us. We thank you, Father, that you've made us sensitive to the majesty of your creation and the innumerable mysteries that it still contains. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen us. By your initiative, you've loved us before we've loved you. Oh, Father, we do pray that you would increase in each of us a hunger and an appetite for your word, increase our capacity to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and all our mind. We do pray, Father, that you would help each of us to be more responsive to your will in our lives, to trust you more, Father, completely, as we commit ourselves in your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.